everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to UC Central Live. We hope you got some good tech sessions in. And uh, now we're going to get to some really exciting things today. Yeah, so thank you, Nick. Welcome back, everyone. I've been really enjoying those tech sessions. And I am particularly excited about today's conversation coming up in the plenary. We're going to be talking about issues affecting the world and of some personal importance to me. Um, there's going to be a huge focus on geospatial literacy and all of the different players and collaborators working together to make sure that the entire globe is equipped with what we need to solve global issues. I will say, Nick, that some of my colleagues at National Geographic Society will be a part of this discussion, but also some key global leaders, thought leaders in these spaces. It's really going to be tremendous, and I can't wait to see how we come out of it. I know I'm going to be bubbling over with thoughts and ideas and excitement from it. Yeah, it's going to be really great. For those of you who have been in San Diego or you've actually watched the plenaries on YouTube, uh, you, know, you know the third part of our plenary on Monday is where we focus on GIS and, and the global big picture. Uh, often education, conservation, sustainable prosperity are typical themes, and this year is no exception. To talk about GIS connecting everyone, everywhere, I've got three very special people to introduce. I'd like to welcome James Fallows, longtime writer for The Atlantic Magazine and great friend of Esri. Of course, if you were here during the last bit, you saw Esri's chief scientist, Don Wright. So happy to welcome you back, Don. And then coming in live from Dubai, our good friend Sohail Albed, Esri's general manager of West Africa, Middle East, excuse me, West Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Sorry, Sahil. Take it away, yeah. folks. Great to see you. Uh, Nick, thanks very much. This is Jim Fallows here in Washington, D.C. I think it's fitting for a conversation setting up a plenary about connections that we have people coming in from three locations spanning 11 time zones, from the Pacific time zone where uh, Dawn is to Eastern time where I am to Dubai time where Sohail is joining us. I'm going to say one word connecting the discussion we're about to have here before the plenary that's ahead of us. It's about the idea of technology and connections. It strikes me in the history of technology, there's always a crucial time when some new innovation shifts from being mainly about itself and of interest to people in that field to being about everything else, where all the rest of the world's activities are connected to that technology. We saw that with electricity. We've seen it with computing power. We've seen it with telephone connectivity and internet connectivity. And I believe we're in the process of also seeing it with geospatial uh, connectivity, geospatial information, GIS tools, and all the rest, where Everything that is happening in the world now, every challenge of sustainability, of governability, of economic resilience, has a very important uh, connection to the tools that we're going to uh, hear Don and Sohail talk about and will be examined at length in the plenary session. Um, each of our two panelists we're about to hear from has been a specialist in these kinds of connections. Don, who is, of course, chief scientist at Esri, is originally an oceanographer but a lot of her mission in recent years has been connecting geospatial science to the rest of science and sciences as a whole to all the challenges humanity has. And so Hale in Dubai has, uh, has practiced connectivity across an entire continent. So let me just go first to Don. Don, tell us what you think are the most important ways we should think about GIS addressing two of the emergencies of this moment. I'm thinking of the pandemic uh, in particular and its health and economic effects and the movement in the U.S. and around the world for racial justice and, and inclusion. Thank you so much, Jim. Yes, I think one of the most important things that we need to realize now is that GIS and other types of information technologies are not for the technical elite. They have been seen as tools that can only be used by specialists, that take a long time to learn, that are complex, that have a lot of wonderful analytics associated with them, but that these are technologies for them and not technologies for us. And so especially now as we are in this perfect storm of the pandemic, as you mentioned, the situation with the economy that falls from that pandemic, the, uh, the awakening and the reckoning now in terms of racial inequity across this country and across the world. And then overarching that is climate change, which still continues to be a planetary emergency. All of these are geospatial issues. And there's a whole 
field now that is looking at how to make complex technology easy. To make something easy to use is not easy. And so my colleagues here at Esri are so wonderful to work with because we have people working on user, inter user uh, interactivity, the user interface, the user interaction, the user experience, and how can we get this technology and the analytics behind it into the hands of children, community organizers, activists, uh, specialists as well, but making all of these tools across the board from something that we can hold in our hands to something that runs on a supercomputer to make it work towards these problems and to couple these tools with uh, data sets, fair and open data sets as well. Uh, thanks. I'll come back in a minute to ask you about some of the specific applications you're most excited about. I love your comment about making tools that are easy to use is not easy. In the writing world, there's a famous line by the late economist John Kenneth Galbraith about the air of spontaneity that comes on the 13th draft. And that is sort of the, 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 the analogous process. Uh, so, Hale, um, Don was telling us about the ways in which tools that are complex and yet being made easy to use are helping people of all walks of life address their main problems. Tell us about how you're doing that in Africa with the geo portal there. Yeah, so simply, I mean, thanks a lot, James. Uh, I mean, simply two years back, we started a new project called Africa Geo Portal. It's a one-stop shop for uh, geographic content and uh, comprehensive uh, web GIS tools simply made available for every person in Africa and anyone who's working for any project or in any project for Africa. It's like made available free of charge. And as Don said, I mean, so um, people, some people, especially those who are not familiar with GIS would assume that GIS is quite complex and very hard to use. From day one, we designed this portal to be very easy for non-GISers to use. Very easy. I mean, you just need to have like, I mean, uh, simple uh, I mean, experience in using computer and being able to like, I mean, use log into any website and just navigate any, any web portal. And you will be able to go through the portal and make a lot, a lot, a lot of, I mean, useful output from, from the portal. And that was the idea. I mean, and the idea started when we attended the uh, Africa GIS conference two years back and simply every single government country representative clearly complained about the lack of geospatial data for Africa, the lack of GIS tools, and GIS tools is very expensive. So when I shared this internally with Jack and the leadership of this company, they immediately approved, yes, we have tons of data for Africa. Why don't we just make it available for the African, I mean, continent? I mean, free of charge. I mean, let them use it. And I believe that in this current situation, the COVID-19 situation, we've seen fantastic use cases, fantastic I mean, uh, success stories out of the Africa Geo Portal because it enabled so many countries in Africa to have access to geospatial technology and they were able even to use it for building all kinds of information products. And I'll just ask you one follow-up here. Could you give us just one brief example of a way that people in, in, across Africa have used the Africa Geo Portal to address either the pandemic issues or, or some other uh, challenge they have? Yes, so simply, I mean, uh, I have one success story and then uh, just uh, I would like to let you know that we have 4,000 active users on Africa Geo Portal at the moment. Mm -hmm. Like in less than 18 months since we started the portal, now we have 4,000 active users. I'm not talking about every, every person who signed up, I'm talking about like users who are visiting the portal like on a daily or weekly basis. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I will share like one success story, like I mean, a young guy from Ghana called Samuel, I mean like literally two months after the pandemic situation was announced. He used the Africa Geoportal, I mean, and he created his own dashboard for Ghana. I mean, dashboard that has all the cases uh, for Ghana, I mean, using the officially reported cases and even using some open source and, and crowdsourced information, I mean, and made, it and made it available for everyone. And his dashboard was like widely used in Ghana and literally, I mean, it hit the news. Uh, this person literally had zero knowledge of GIS, so he started from zero to ten. I mean, he just went through, uh, he, uh, I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at the portal. The portal offers, like, I mean, lots of training materials, like in form of very short videos, like three minutes sh uh, long video. I mean, educating the individuals on how to use GIS, how to create maps, how to create dashboards. So he was able to go through the education system, uh, the education materials we have in the portal, and he created an end-to-end -end dashboard without any kind of help and he was very, very recognized across the continent. 
Great, thank you. So, so Don Sohill is giving us an illustration of the way that people can use what was once arcane technology, it's still very complex in this operation, as a simple tool that empowers people and gives them control and they can lead, a, you know, use in directions that, that the, the creators of the technology might not have foreseen. As you have um, th- worked both in the US and around the world to give people tools for inclusion, for empowerment, for dashboards or civic hubs, would you give us a couple examples that you think are most worth notice of, about the way people have used these tools in empowering and inclusive ways? Yes, thank you, Jim. And I love those words, empowering and inclusive, because they are also synonymous now with citizen science. Two more words. Citizen science is a movement. Uh, It is now a new mode of research. And there are some wonderful activities that are going on in that space. I would like to highlight Earth Challenge 2020. Earth Challenge 2020 is an initiative. It's an event. It's an ongoing series of research questions It's really the brainchild of Dr. Ann Bowser of the Wilson Center, working with Kathleen Rogers of EarthDay.org, working with my colleague Charmel Menzel of our National Government Sciences team, along with the Department of State and many other organizations. And the idea of Earth Challenge 2020 in this, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, is to empower and include citizens around the world on a series of major issues So what they're doing right now, and they did this on Earth Day, but it's continuing. They have several different research questions. Uh, How much plastic is polluting my neighborhood? What is the quality of my air? Am I subject to a disease uh, that's possible because of the insects that are in my neighborhood? What about my drinking water? Am I getting clean drinking water? And what are the local impacts of climate change in my community? In order to address those questions, they are empowered through a hub that the Earth Challenge 2020 organization has built with our technology. The hub is chock full of story maps, of learning modules, but I think most importantly, apps. Apps that children, uh, adults, anyone with an interest in these issues can download onto their phone and then they can get to work actually gathering data And this is high quality data that addresses one of those questions. For instance, with the plastic pollution, you can go, people went around their neighborhoods with their phones, they took uh, photos, they uploaded it to a global hub, and then they actually moved forward to clean up uh, the plastic in their neighborhood. So this is action oriented as well as being uh, inclusive and empowering. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. So, so Hill, I'm going to ask you a question I didn't prepare you for, but I've been thinking about while hearing your, your stories. You have this continent-wide um, project in Africa that has been empowering individual citizens and scientists and business and other people to make connections. How have the sovereign governments of the many countries there reacted to this uh, this kind of connect, this citizen connectivity? Have they been supportive? Have they been suspicious? What's been your experience? So my experience was fantastic because I mean we have I mean we didn't even we didn't ignore them. Let me put it this way. I mean from day one we designed support to, to include also government, and we introduced concept called the country page, government country page. Simply every country, each country would have access uh, can own a page like uh, owned and controlled and managed by the country itself, where the country can publish its open source data, they can publish, I mean, data on investment opportunities, attraction, or even challenges, I mean, issues that they would invite, I mean, experts to come and help with. And so far, I mean, we launched this page uh, less than six months back, and so far we have 15 countries signed up, and we have many country pages now up and running where, I mean, the countries themselves, I mean, they own the page and they assigned, I mean, government officials to own the page and administrate the page with with little support from us, which was very, very interesting because even like now, I mean, the the rest of Africa started to say, yeah, where is my page? And they started to line up and sign up for for their own page. I mean, the whole concept here is that we're trying to promote the, the data sharing culture. I mean, GIS without data sharing doesn't make any sense. 
And portals, I mean, look look around yourself. Like most of the portals worldwide now is only one-way communication. I mean, someone is sharing data with, with the rest of the world. Africa Geoportal allows also did like two-way communication. So we as ESRI and the other contributors are sharing data with the wider African continent. And now you get the like 15 countries are sharing data. I mean, adding new data uh, to the portal and sharing it with the wider continent. And uh, we're, we're introducing the same concept also for uh, the organizations operating in Africa, African Union, African Development Bank, USAID mission in Africa. We're inviting all of them to have, again, their organization page where they can publish information on their projects, I mean, and activities promoting the transparency between all these organizations, I mean, in order to have some sort of, I mean, coordinated efforts. Uh, great. Well, it does illustrate the connectivity, which is the theme of the conference. Uh, Don, we have about uh, three minutes or so before we turn people over to the main plenary session. I wanted to ask you a lessons of experience question in this last while. I think of you as being one of the main evangelists of the GIS world to the rest of the world, the rest of the scientific world, and the rest of the uh, of, of the the rest of the world of, of how science and GIS science can address their challenges. What are the main lessons you have learned for people in the GIS world to extend their message, extend their gospel, if you will, about why these tools are so effective? What seems to work when you're talking in a small town with a mayor, with a governor, with a senator about why they should, uh, they should uh, adopt this, this approach to their problems? That's a great question, Jim, and it really gets to the heart of science communication, uh, all of us are communicators in various ways, and we are now learning to communicate in different modes. We can no longer spill out the uh, acronyms that are uh, familiar to us in our specialties, uh, in remote sensing or in cartography or in GIS. We have to learn to speak the language of our audiences. And we have to uh, have the courage uh, to do that. So that's why story maps have taken off uh, so wonderfully, because it helps us to speak in these different languages. Uh, even, in, even a web map that you can interact, show a congressman a web map and let him or her explore, add their own data, and to see their, uh, their district in a different way. Very, very powerful. Uh, great. So, uh, so Hale, I'm going to give you the final minute and a half or so here of when, if you're talking to people from Latin America or from Southeast Asia and you say, here is the main lesson of what we've done in Africa, what would be the main lesson you would be uh, bringing to people in other parts of the world? I believe it's, uh, I mean, the empowerment. I mean, Africa Geoportal, I mean, represents, I mean, a, a very powerful tool that was never available for the African people, I'm being very honest. Now, I mean, they have access to uh, fantastic tools al alongside data I mean, for them to voice out their challenges, the requirements, I mean, for their governments and, or, and the world to respond to. And I believe, I mean, since we started this project, I mean, every day we get, I mean, new projects, new ideas, like someone created a map, I mean, that highlights, I mean, all the villages in, 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 in an African country that doesn't have um, access to education or health, or health services. Someone created another map that has, I mean, the, that shows the villages where students, I mean, need to walk like uh, 10 kilometers to reach a school. So can you imagine sharing this and voicing this out with the wider community? Inviting it, hey guys, I mean, all right, so it's, a, it's a very powerful and it has been great. Uh, that is wonderful. So we're about to go to the plenary session in, in, a, in a few seconds. I just wanted to say, Don and Sohail, we've just been the very little tip of the iceberg of the potential of what you've been doing in Africa, in the United States, around the world. I know that in the plenary that's coming up, there's going to be a really rich presentation of exactly these themes, of how the technologies you all are developing and propagating around the world can be applied to the world's problems. So the three of us are going to join again after the plenary for a wrap-up. So let's join the plenary now. And thanks to you both. <laughs>